Now, let's go on. Not only who God is, what God has decreed, what God has done in history, in the gospel, and in you, but God will, what God will do. This is something that I, as a Christian of many, many years, over 30 years, if there's any truth that I have to remind myself of, it's this one more than any other truth. You know, people will say, you know, this is the only life you get. You can't hit replay. You can't hit replay. This is the only life you get. That's true. But this is not as good as it gets. What is waiting for us? Future grace. 1 Corinthians 2.9 Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love Him. And don't you, don't you dare because I will come down there and I will whip you. Don't you say, ah, there's the key for those who love Him. And I don't love Him perfectly. Will you just stop it? Stop it. Stop doing that. He doesn't love you because your love's perfect. The tautology that we have in Deuteronomy chapter 7, where basically it's set before Israel. Israel, why do I love you? Okay, I'll give you the answer. Israel, I love you because I love you. And what he's saying, it came from me. It was my decision. I elected it. I decided it. I set my love on you. There it is. My love did not begin with you. It doesn't stand with you. It won't end with you. It began with me, stands with me, ends with me. I love you. But I don't deserve it. Would you shut up? See, Jamie, you don't have to be cultured or intelligent to preach here. I'm evidence. Quit it. There's a counseling, well, it's a, it's a funny thing on, on YouTube. My wife showed me the other day, and she loves it because the person comes into this counselor, and they tell all the problems, and the counselor says, well, I can answer this in two words. Stop it. Stop it. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, what? So that in the ages to come, you can have a little cabin on a hillside somewhere. No. So that on the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God has saved you in order to demonstrate to all creation, including principalities, powers, mights, and dominions, how good He is. That's why He saved you. And that's why He chose you. Not many noble, not many wise, not the big ones, not the smart ones. Why did Paul say, why did He choose the base ones, the weak ones, the ones that are not? Why? so that He could show how good He is. Lavishing the greatest blessings, turning over the inheritance of His own Son to the worst humanity has to offer. Imagine if someone was getting bad press, a billionaire was getting bad press, that he wasn't charitable. And so he just <coughs> picks you and says, I'm going to be, I'm going to use you for a special purpose. I'm going to lavish all my wealth upon you so that every time someone looks at you, they understand how charitable, how good, how loving and kind I am. How many of you would sign up for that? That's what God has done. Let me put it this way. That when you walk in to glory, it will be an object lesson for all creation. Even creation that we don't even know or understand. And they will look at what you were, what you are, what God has done, the grace He has poured out on you, 
And they will worship God in a way they could have never worshipped Him before if He had not done this good thing for you. But then it doesn't stop there. If we could say that there is chronology or day after day in heaven, if we could say such a thing so that our mind could comprehend it, every day God would increase the grace, lavish more and more upon you each day so that each day all of creation will look at you and have a greater vision of how God is and worship Him to a greater degree. Folks, that's a great future. This is absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful. Sometimes when I'm, I'm working on a book on the gospel and I'll come in the office and they'll say, what did you study yesterday? He's wonderful. He's wonderful. It doesn't matter what language I know. There's no word. I can't. It makes me so mad. What's waiting you is so Wonderful. The one waiting you. His, his name is wonderful. But please, saints, please, I, I'm begging you, look, don't live this life. Don't continue on. You've, you've, if, I could, if I could give you anything, if I could pray one thing for you, I mean, above everything else, if you're truly a child of God, if I could give you one gift, it would be that you would comprehend something of His love for you. It'd be that. Really. I'm tired of seeing you tired. I'm tired of seeing me tired. If you could, I mean, if you just grasp that one thing, he loves me immutably. End with an illustration, I promise I'll end. When I was in Peru, my first years as a single missionary, and the moment, practically from the moment I was converted, this is going to sound all cycle babble, I don't care, it's true. But when I was in school, I was never like in the inner circle. Not the best athlete, not the best this, not the best that. And I determined that when I became a Christian, yeah, it was fleshly. You can do your diagnosis, but please do it at home. Right now, just listen. I determined that would not happen to me in my Christian life. I determined that there wouldn't be this idea of there's Spurgeon and Martin Lloyd-Jones and all their inner circle, the guys that God really loves, and I'm outside somewhere. I determined that would not happen. And I worked 18 hours a day for years. And if I had a chance to go get martyred, I tried to do it. Until the point where I, I weigh like 225 right now. I weighed about 169 pounds. And I killed myself. I killed myself. And one day, on the third floor of this old building where we took care of street kids and we had our church during the war in Peru. It was all bombed out and everything else and I slept in a little room on the third floor. I was going up the last little flight of stairs and I collapsed. And I said this, I cried out, I screamed it. I don't want to go to hell because I, I'm afraid of hell. I don't want to go to heaven because I'm ashamed. Just put me somewhere. Just put me somewhere. It was at that moment that it was just a work of the Lord. Scripture started coming to mind, different things. I realized, yeah, how fleshly everything had been, how wrong I was. But here's the thing. I recognized God loved me. Loved me. That I didn't have to move to the left or the right that was the thing I thought that day. I was sitting on the steps and I was looking at myself and I realized I don't have to move a quarter of an inch to the left or a quarter inch to the right. I don't have to be a great missionary. I don't have to die as a martyr. I don't have to be a great preacher. I don't have to do anything because it is all in. It's God. It's in God. He did it all. He made the decision. He carries it through. He brings it to its end. I am loved.
What a wonderful release that it's just Him. It's Him. For every once, I'll say, I'll take a Puritan statement and modernize it. For every, t every one glance you take of yourself in the mirror, take ten long looks at God and His love. You're loved. This is just a terrible thing about being a preacher. I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to get something through your thick head. And it is this. God really, really, really does love you immutably so, perfectly so. And it is all founded upon Him. His person, His decrees, His work through Christ on your behalf. All of it. It's done. It's done. You've got to walk in that. You've got to keep yourselves in the love of God. You've got to keep thinking it, believing it, walking in it, talking it. 